Um, I'm your moderator. I'm Greg Lindsay. I'm a senior fellow at the New Cities Foundation. You're here to listen to reducing air and noise pollution in cities. Um, given the massive scale and pace of urbanization over the next 40 years, we're going to see incredible both densification cities and also urban sprawl, uh, which will place incredible demand on cities to not only decarbonize their transport from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint, but also major quality of life issues. How do we basically avoid having massive uh, car choked highways? How do we avoid the massive air and noise pollution that results from large scale urban infrastructure such as highways and rail corridors um, and all the other sort of externalities that come with urban life? Because we know that even as we try, even as we aspire to densify our urban landscape, um, today is Cities Day, I should note here at the summit. Um, even as we try to densify our, our urban landscape uh, for various issues, which Colin will discuss here in terms of what we want to do for sort of land use policy, um, uh, we also know that with that comes all of these sort of potential negative aspects of, of living cheek by jowl in cities and, and, uh, and dealing with all of these uh, externalities that come from transport. So I'm joined this morning here by a distinguished panel who are going to discuss these issues at length. To my immediate left here is Colin Hughes, who's Director of National Policy and Project Evaluation for the Institute of Transportation Policy and Development, ITDP. To his left is uh, Pex Langenberg, who is the Vice Mayor for Mobility, Sustainability, and Culture for the City of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, to his left is Philippe Citron, who is the Director General of, is it Unify? Unife, Unife is the pronunci correct pronunciation, the European rail industry, who's going to discuss some of the nuts and bolts of the various rail issues involved. Um, and then finally, on the end, is, uh, is Michael Bultmann, who's the managing director of HERE, here in Germany, um, who's going to discuss some of the digital issues with that. So to get us started, uh, in an ITF summit time-honored fashion, we're going to ask each of, each of the gentlemen up here to make some sort of opening remarks um, to sort of discuss their particular perspectives on this. And so I'd like Colin to go first to really talk about your work at ITDP and particularly the sort of you know, broad, you know, the very big picture here in terms of you know, the avoid, shift, improve paradigm for how we improve the sustainability of urban transport uh, and getting into some of these issues. So please. Thanks, Greg. Um, I think in, in this discussion, you know, there's three different topical areas where we can talk about improvements in air pollution and noise pollution. Um, and I'd start, and I think what I've heard a lot about at this conference has been vehicle technology. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of technological advancement right now in electric vehicles, um, talk of zero, zero emissions vehicles uh, that are very quiet coming online in the near future. Uh, the this, this second topical area I think that can do a lot to make improvements in this realm is just the shifting of modes. So it's finding ways to better leverage walking, biking, transit. And then thirdly, it's the shape of our cities. And I think I'm, I'm really interested in these last two. How do we shift modes and how do we change the shape of our cities uh, so that they are denser and that they support these modes? Um, the technological solutions, I think, you know, um, zero emission vehicles, for instance, fully electric vehicles, um, they might really address pollution, at least at the mobile source, because of course, any electric vehicle, its ultimate emissions impact comes from the electrical grid that it's coming from. Uh, and, uh, and, and they could be, they could be very quiet, but with transport, we, we always have to remember that it's, that there's a, there's a big picture. Um, nobody, transport is not a primary good. No one consumes it for its own sake. It's a secondary good, and the primary good is always access. And so what we need to do is to improve access in our cities, and I think that's going to come with densification, uh, with, with bringing people closer to each other. Um, of course, there's a lot of important planning that needs to happen there. Um, Transit-oriented development, we're continually developing standards on how to make these areas that are dense, still attractive, still conducive to a vibrant urban life, still have great public space for people. Um, and, and that requires very good design, very good planning. But I think that's ultimately where we hit the synergy, where we have not only low air and noise pollution, but we also have more equitable cities. Uh, they're energy efficient, so we're not, even if we have zero emission vehicles, we're not using a great deal of energy to power them far distances. So, uh, yeah, with that, I think I'll pass it along. Thank you. Next, Pex will talk a bit about some of the concrete work that the city of Rotterdam has done on these issues. Can you go mic over there? Um, sure. Go stand up left hand, please. Good morning, everyone, the brave one who are here, third day, nine o'clock, 
Very good, thank you. Um, so I would like to give you a broad overview about our practical things we are doing in the uh, city of Rotterdam. Also to make a little commercial for uh, Polis, of course. Uh, I'm happy to be the president this year of Polis. And you know Polis is uh, the leading platform of cities and regions working together on kinds of urban mobility issues. Uh, and we are also in Polis working from Brussels office uh, on these issues of uh, uh, equality and noise, but then <coughs> from uh, general transport challenges. And this year, one of the central items are, um, of course, noise and environment. In the city of Rotterdam, like uh, so many other cities, we are happy to grow because the, the biggest crisis is over, uh, and uh, that means an increasing number of residents, more cars, visitors, economic activity, and that means also more harmful emissions and unhealthy air. <clears throat> Some places, 50% of harmful, unhealthy su su substance emission or originates from traffic, even in a big city like uh, Rotterdam, where the port is right in the middle of the city. Still, traffic, just cars, uh, is a, a very uh, contributor to unhealthy air. So that's why we take a lot of me measures and actions to, uh, to fight that. Based on the city lounge idea, we strongly advocate using bikes. As you know, we have more bikes than people in the Netherlands, but also public transport for passenger mobility. And there's going to be an, uh, an electric bike sharing system with distribution points at uh, public transport stations, and residents can inspire each other by uh, being part of a digital uh, uh, bike uh, community. Car use, especially for the short trips, must decrease and also, like previous speaker said, land use planning is ab absolutely very important to decrease the use of the car. And if you use a car, please use an electric car. Uh, for example, our main street is a four-lane uh, four road in the city center, will be redeveloped in much car-restricted boulevard with plenty of space for cycling, walking and green areas. And moreover, at the end of the year, we hope that we will reach 2,000 charging points for electric cars in the city. At the beginning of this year, we started a large environmental zone, the largest of uh, the Netherlands, which applies both to passenger cars and trucks. And an environmental zone is a fairly effective measure, although it's quite debatable, uh, but still we think even with the zone, things are not moving fast enough, and as a city, we must take really greater steps bigger steps to be able to breathe healthier air. So I'm looking forward to discussion this morning how we can do that even better in uh, Rotterdam. Although it accounts for 10% only of the traffic movements, trucks and delivery traffic represent a relatively large polluter, good for about 60% of NOx emissions and 40% of the PM10. So being uh, concentrate on, uh, on vans and trucks is a really important policy item in Rotterdam. A large number of vans are a particular cause of concern. That's why we, as a city, we, talk, we try to talk with frontrunners like DHL about uh, the urban logistics. And we ask them, can we do something collectively, so together? Yes, they said. We certainly we want to do something. Let's work to, together to achieve zero emission urban logistics by 2020. So that's 10 years earlier than the EU. It's quite ambitious. It's the start of the Green Deal, uh, as we call it, the Green Deal, zero emissions urban logistics. One example is, for example, the light electric vehicles. Uh, that's one of the initiatives we started, uh, or also cargo bikes that perform last mile deliveries. And the plan is now developed to grant electric vehicles privileges, so as the use of bus lanes and more free delivery times. But in all honesty, in spite of all these measures, actions, initiatives, zero emission urban logistics can only be achieved if electric or hybrid electric fans and trucks become available. Because we think electric power is the only form that really offers zero emissions and is also quiet. At this moment, electric cars, I mean electric fans, the trucks, are only tested on a very small scale. Heineken now uses an electric truck, one, only one, but Heineken at least does something 
uh, uses an electric truck for catering deliveries in Rotterdam, and it is very successful. There are more many more shippers like Sligro, the largest food and beverage wholesaler of the Netherlands, are also good for about 2,000 vehicles in the Netherlands, who have indicated that they would like to switch to electric vehicles. However, two obstacles are still uh, in the way of this transition. First, the vehicles are not widely available, so manufacturers, please go on in, uh, in innovation in this field. And the second one, the investment is too high, so it would be very welcome if uh, local governments, national European governments, could do something about that in fear of uh, subsidies. The business case is still a problem. So, therefore, we appeal to the authorities, speed up and set up a European fund for subsidy scheme or a subsidy scheme to help finance electric vans and trucks. A real need exists. And as I said, manufacturers, please innovate, develop an electric truck. There is still a big demand. The city, to conclude, the city of Rotterdam is more than willing to serve as a testing ground for innovations. And Polis would like to uh, also to evaluate new schemes in all kinds of city of regions here in Europe uh, to also to, to, to talk about it, to, uh, if necessary, to organize conferences about it, because we think this is a message we should convey in a large system. In this way, we can all, so authorities, manufacturers, uh, and of course the delivery, uh, man, uh, delivery uh, firms themselves, we can all uh, deliver more and contribute to cleaner air, not only here in Rotterdam, not only in Leipzig, but all, all the cities in uh, Europe are dedicated, of course, to a better quality of life for its residents, and we think in this uh, field there are still many steps to take. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> All right, we've heard so far about a bit about cycling, we've heard about electric vehicles and the environmental zone. Philippe is now gonna talk about rail because of course, when it comes to you know, dealing with the heavy issues, rail is the answer for a lot of decarbonization of transport. So do you wanna take a turn at the lectern yourself real fast? Well, good morning. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say that uh, Unifair represent the uh, rail supply industry, so that's uh, the manufacturers, those who build uh, running stock, uh, signaling and uh, working signaling infrastructure. And uh, I would start my, my presentation by saying that um, I think that really is certainly the solution to air pollution and electrification is as well. And light rail, metros and commuter trains, are certainly the less polluting public transport means in urban areas. It's also important for me, uh, as we are here in this uh, forum, and we have been discussing a lot about uh, decarbonization of transport, that rail today generates only 0.7% of the total energy-related CO2 emission, while meeting 9% of global mobility. This is particularly true in urban uh, uh, areas. And despite overall transport emissions increasing, the emissions of the rail sector have decreased significantly and continue to do so. For instance, between 1919 and 2010, an estimated 20% energy consumption reduction has already been obtained compared to 1919 vehicles. And the savings could represent as much as 50% on certain types of vehicles Regenerating, breaking, or energy storage technology have contributed to this result. Uh, I, I just want to mention as well uh, the, the problems that we are facing with the, the rail traffic, which is currently powered by diesel, because this is, of course, a problem in terms of uh, uh, pollution. But I want to confirm that the rail industry is committed to do much more and to reduce exhaust gas emissions. And there are a lot of European uh, programs. I will not go into details, but there is, for example, the Cleaner D uh, project, which has been working on re emissions reduction technologies for diesel locomotives and re vehicles. And I want to reassure the Vice Mayor of Rotterdam that we are really working a lot on these important topics. We have, are working as well 
on energy efficiency and CO2 e emission. There is a program uh, uh, which has just been uh, and which has just ended in, in, in Brussels called OSIRIS on the reduction of the, in the energy consumption of urban rail solutions. And there is as well the light weighting of uh, rail vehicles, which will be an area where the industry sees particular potential. The way for lighter weighting uh, rolling structure will consume less energy and further reduce rail system CO2 emissions. You have to know that uh, two years ago at the, in, in Brussels, uh, the, the Council of Ministers of Transport have approved a, a big program, a PPP program for rail research, which is called Shift to Rail. I don't know if you've heard about this program. It's a PPP of 920 million euros which is shared by the European institution and by the industry, not only the rail supply industry, but the, you have infrastructure managers, operators, uh, uh, universities, uh, uh, research centers, and they are working a lot on these uh, uh, pollution issues. Now, on rail noise, uh, this is an extremely sensitive uh, uh, um, dossier, and I know that in, in Germany there's, there's those debates about uh, the Rhine Valley, and uh, uh, of course uh, we have to find a, 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 a solution. We know that the, co the Commission wants a shift of 30% of long distance road freight to more energy efficient transport by 2030 and 50% by 2050. This is what you can find in the white paper. And the, the agenda focuses on the few specific challenges, including securing societal and political acceptance and support of rail freight, such as in the area of rail noise. At urban level, uh, the noise perceptions, from what we see, varies throughout Europe, depending on population density, traffic, and political acceptance. In shift to rail, there will, there will be a work area specifically dedicated to reducing noise and vibrations. And recently, there's been the, an agreement on the, uh, the European transport platform called ERAC. There's an ERAC noise and vibrations roadmap called uh, uh, 2030, which has defined goals for future research. Normally, in this official document, it is written by that by 2030, noise mitigation measures will be integrated naturally in all relevant processes of the railways. And the European railways will strive towards that noise and vibrations are no longer considered a problem for the railways and their neighbors, meaning that noise levels will be socially and economically acceptable and allow for 24 hours passengers and goods operations by 2050. This is extremely ambitious. Now, the main issue is that you know that we have to find a way to replace gas iron brake blocks with composite trade brake blocks in an effective uh, way. And this is extremely expensive, uh, what you say. Today, if you want to retrofit noisy wagons all over Europe, we need to find billions of euros for doing that. We have not found the, the solution. I know that the, the Commission is thinking about uh, issues uh, uh, which could be solved by uh, differentiated track access charges, revisions of the noise TSIs, direct funding through CEF, research fund through Shift Rail, but uh, we didn't find a solution. But it's true that uh, we have to find a solution if we want to solve these issues about uh, noise. We know that the Commission is working on this, but I think that the pressure should come from the member states. But th there is no solution for, for, the, for the time being. We know that some member states are going to spend more money on it. But at the global level of Europe, there is, for the time being, no financial solution. Let's hope that they will find one. So on our side, I want to say that the industry is really committed to continue to work on those issues of noise and uh, pollution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's funny, I'm already imagining this, this new world where, where the only sounds in cities are the, are the pings of bicycle bells and the soft purr of electric cars and the quietness of electric trams. Um, Michael is going to talk a bit about what happens when we start overlaying digital tools on top of this. So now that we've talked about modal shifts and now that we've talked about some of the land use stuff, what happens when we bring some of the digital tools to bear? And what, not only what exists, but what are some of the most interesting areas of possibility? Where are the real gains to be made in terms of how we can figure out how to identify hotspots <coughs> of pollution, how to identify uh, areas that we can improve congestion flows, 
to, uh, to reduce further noise and air pollution, so please. Yeah, first of all, good morning, everybody, and thanks a lot for this kind invitation. Um, in the, in the uh, kind of introduction you mentioned, well, it is something about digital. Um, let me share maybe three, four observations with you and start with a, with a clear statement. Um, for, I think we had a digital revolution. I know you all heard about and you're reading about, you're talking about, but all what has been shared now from the rail industry, from the city, from other perspectives, has one common denominator, and it is about data and digitalization. I mean, this is a very powerful and very positive development. If you combine data in an intelligent and smart way, you can really do a big difference when it comes to bringing down pollution, air pollution, noise pollution, and congestion in general terms. Maybe one quick word about what he is doing, because the term um, is kind of, I'm not from Leipzig, even if there's, he, he, I'm from here. Um, here is a location intelligence provider, which has recently been acquired by a consortium consisting of three German car manufacturers, Audi, BMW, and Daimler. Um, we are not doing mobility and automotive only. We have consumer and uh, enterprise businesses with roughly 6,500 people around the globe. Uh, uh, I'm in Berlin, we have in Berlin, in Berlin Mitte, roughly 1,100 people, mainly focusing on software application. So it's a highly data-intensive business model. We are really kind of, uh, well, playing with data, data mining, smart data, um, location intelligence, meaning what you are using in the car when it is about navigating from one place to another. But of course, in times when we talk about autonomous driving, it is about really identifying where exactly is a car and where to go next. So this is a bit the challenge and the topic um, in general terms. Maybe three examples and observations where we see um, the relevance for air and noise pollution. The first example um, I, I would like to share is, is about um, simply, let's say, parking space availability. We all know that there are different numbers uh, in the world, whether it's now 20 or 30 percent of the traffic in cities has to do with people looking for, for a parking slot. Um, the, the clear answer to is, is, of course, the transparency and the knowledge of free parking spaces from, from sensors, and there are projects not only in the US but as well in, in Europe, that cars can communicate free parking slots and that the infrastructure of a city on the pavement can indicate this information and bring forward uh, to the cars would make a dramatic benefit, irrespective of the engine, whether it's now electromobility or classical engine. This is, of course, a very important uh, issue. But the information about in availability would make in dense urban and the cities a real difference. The other question to come to more accurate traffic service in general is, of course, that for us, a car, or I should not say car, a mobility solution in those days, um, um, is of course not, nothing else for us than an extended sensor. And if we are bringing from all these different fleets around the world, this, the sensor data, of course, on an anonymized basis, into location intelligence, you have a huge potential to really improve real-time information and know exactly where cars are, uh, what areas need to be avoided. And if this information is not just going as an information to the passenger, but if this information is going straight from car to car, you know, this uh, like car to car uh, communication, uh, the potential of uh, improving the traffic flow is tremendous. Maybe the, another example and a very striking one and an observation um, has to do um, simply with the traffic flow. There's an interesting study, I think it's from the UK, uh, where they're describing what would happen if the cars would really not, well, s stop before red light and, and, and would kind of have a real flow. We all know that in, if the traffic is bad, um, people are accelerating, they're speeding up, they're stopping. And if you take, would take out this kind of traffic behavior, and in autonomous driving scenarios, it's very easy to overcome this situation, um, you would bring down the, the, uh, the consumption um, of fuel by more than 30%. I'm always very skeptical when it comes to surveys, and if it's not 30%, it would be only 20%. What a difference. So again, with intelligent information coming from the traffic lights, coming from the construction zones, not going to some traffic centers, but going to the cars, you would really make a big, big difference. 
And final observation, and then I'm done with my observations, and I'm happy for, 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 for discussions with all of you. Um, we had talked about electromobility. The, the main challenge we see, and we had some journalists driving through Europe and testing electromobility, yes, it is a range. And of course, a battery is, is, is key. But clearly, people are uncertain and they are afraid that they are running into a problem and they are stuck somewhere with, with no power. And again, what counts is transparency and information. And if you have a clear information and you are guided to the next available and working charging station where your payment method is accepted, then I'm, I'm sure that the consumer will take that on board and they can really rely on. And again, it's all about, about software, about intelligence, what, what will make the difference uh, and will really be beneficial for accepting those, uh, those, those systems. What I feel, and this is a final comment, um, when we talk in Europe about data and digitalization, it's, it's always, kind of, the starting point is very often concerns about privacy, security, and this is, of course, extremely important and need to be addressed. However, I would invite really everybody, in particular when it is about air and noise pollution and about sustainability in general terms, to open up and to see the beauty and the potential of data if you are kind of combining it in an intelligent manner. So this is really an excellent opportunity. And if you talk about autonomous driving, yes, it is about security and safety. Of course, it is about participation but it is as well about sustainability, and this is something worth to deepen and work more on. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I was about to remark that I couldn't believe that we'd made it through this entire opening discussion with no mention of autonomous cars, and there it was at the very end. Because I would say the first question I have for, for all of you, and I'm, I'm curious how you choose to take it is, is, it's interesting, only until we got to Michael did we have a real discussion, an in-depth discussion about cars. I mean, Pax touched upon it a little bit with electrification. And so my question is, given the scope of our session, reducing air and noise pollution, if we electrified all vehicles tomorrow, would, would be able, if we electrified all cars in cities tomorrow, could we declare our job done and walk away? What is the problem with pure electro, electro mobility then? Is that, is that enough or you know, do we have to continue to basically restrict the car? I'm curious the, the future of the car from the context of this question. Should we continue to encourage their adoption if they're electric and potentially autonomous so we can optimize the routes? Or is it something where we need to apply still further punitive measures through congestion pricing and other things? Colin, I think you were reaching for a microphone. Yeah, you saw me uh, <laughs> reaching already. Um, I think absolutely not. I think mm -hmm. if we electrify all vehicles, uh, we are still gonna have cities that have, we're still gonna have obesity epidemics. Mm -hmm. We're still gonna have cities that are highly inequitable. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have cities that aren't beautiful and lives that aren't very fun because we're still gonna be stuck in cars. And um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, I'm going to keep pushing against the boundaries of this discussion because we, we do have a limited scope here talking about noise pollution and air pollution. Mm -hmm. But again, the thing with transportation is that it, it reaches far beyond just the air we breathe. Um, it's part of our everyday life. It's part of our lifestyle. And it's also a big part of the broader city that we live in and the shape of that. And so I think any discussion with mobility really has to first come after a discussion of the city we want and the type of life that we want. Um, when, when we start talking about technological fixes for some of the issues with our current dependence on automobility, um, I think we're, we're very likely to, we, to maybe address certain issues, um, but not others. You know, when we started having lots of cars, congestion became an issue, so we invented the freeway. Uh, did that solve everything? No. Um, even some of the, the, you know, some of the smart, some of the smart technologies about, uh, you know, I think we have to be, I think uh, some of the, uh, some of the solutions that were mentioned about finding smart parking and getting rid of circling um, and improving congestion, I think those are really important technologies, but I also think they can really only happen if we begin pricing mm -hmm. automobile use, because the more capacity that we open up in our streets, we know um, we have a long history of that any increases in capacity simply induce more demand to come in and, and fill up the space that we freed. And, you know, like in the United States, we have, there's a, there was a study of 500 lane expansions on highways by Robert Cervero all over the country, and 495 of them, within five years, the congestion level on the expanded highway was the same or worse than it was uh, before this massive infrastructure project was mm -hmm. put into, um, 
to relieve it. So uh, again, you know, I think we got to start with that vision of the city with the lives that we want. Uh, I think, you know, we all know that climate change, air pollution, noise pollution are big issues. Um, but let's say that those weren't. Would we still, do we still think the cities that we have other than that are perfect right now, especially the areas of new development? I think a lot of us wouldn't. I think, we, I think there's a lot of other big issues that we need to solve. So we have to keep those in mind while, while some of the technological vehicle uh, solutions could fix these issues. Um, I would say that's not good enough, that, that we have to be looking for systems and, and especially cities and transit-oriented uh, development design that gets to a, a broader set of solutions. Cars are evil. Rebuttal, anyone? Anyone? No, we all agree. Please, yes. oh, uh, Pax and Michael, I, please. I take the red one. It matches with our ties better. I'm going to agree with <laughs> Uh, I fully agree. I think we should uh, do both, Electri uh, electrify everything, if possible, trucks, personal, uh, passenger cars, but uh, first of all, still uh, have your policies in reducing the use of the car. And we are, of course, uh, maybe not in Canada or US where there's so much space, but the dense populated areas in Europe, we need to reduce the use of the car. You see uh, new generations, they don't uh, uh, assess the ownership of the car as much as previous generations do, so that's a chance, especially in, um, in inner cities. We always say uh, use bike and public transport for distances lower than seven kilometers, use, the, use a bike, and maybe for 12 kilometers and lower, use the electric bike. So uh, that's first. Secondly, I think parking policies always uh, help uh, enormously in steering uh, use of cars. Um, of course, uh, you can make a lot of parking garages, but that attracts uh, many cars to the inner city. You need them, of course, for uh, retail, etc. But uh, always think about it. Can you use another way of transport or use uh, parking uh, spaces uh, outside the city ring? So there are many, many options uh, to, to use, uh, to reduce the use of the car. Land use planning, you talked about it, is of course the most, most important. Um, we can do a little bit more on that already. Um, what about uh, the, the trucks and the, um, the vans, uh, electricity? I, talk, I spoke about it. We have now uh, 2,000 charging points for passenger cars. Also, fast charging points uh, is really something, a quality issue. Uh, and for the vans and the trucks, um, we're trying to do also the automatic cars. And now in, in the port, we have some areas where we can have uh, trucks uh, without drivers, and at least trucks which uh, can drive very close to each other, mm -hmm. which is already something which uh, reduces the use of fuel. So many options, many uh, new policies are possible. Now I know the EU, and then I will stop the, <laughs> the EU, as part of the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive. Member states have to submit their plans in uh, November, and, and it gives the chance for member states to, to, to state about um, their targets, their objectives, and their actions. Uh, so uh, we hope um, that uh, many states will do that. Uh, and then it's important, of course, that member states will work together with the regions and the local authorities to make those plans and to get to those actions and targets. Thank you. Michael. Well, in principle, a lot has been said. Uh, I mean, clearly, the job would not be done uh, if we would just replace the engine and then yeah. we say, well, we have all fine. I mean, there's a bit of a provocative picture I thought once when somebody was making a picture of, I think it was Paris, where it was a lot of congestion today. And what would happen in times of electromobility? Same picture. And what would happen in, in, in times of autonomous or full autonomous driving on level five? Same picture. So, of course, we need to, to see that all together um, to have some innovative mobility approaches. And I do not foresee that, um, and uh, not even the, the car manufacturers, they fully understand that they are now mobility providers. So the future of car as a highly individual object um, where one person is using it completely alone in dense urban, sentence, I think uh, this is more and more coming uh, coming to an end. Mm -hmm. It's of course not black and white in the situational countryside where you have, I don't know, three dogs and four children and uh, you need to buy a lot, uh, and transport a lot of stuff, maybe different. Um, and, and of course, I mean, autonomous driving, the first steps will be clearly that in, in, in bigger cities you have special lanes where you are extremely happy and relieved if you can, can just um, take the hands from the wheel and can relax a bit when there's some some bad traffic in the morning. But if you're on vacation uh, somewhere in South Italy and you would like to drive through some curves, you can.
take do that still. So it will not be boom, a uh, complete different scenario. It would evolve step by step. But one commercial comment, I mean, this is a real excellent opportunity for new business models. Mm -hmm. I mean, the old classical value chains of having one producer who is offering uh, 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 one product, these times, I think, are in the context of what we are discussing over as well. So a lot of opportunity. I would say, I, well, please, Philippe. Yeah. I just wanted to say that uh, we have to be careful when we have these kind of discussions because the, 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 the situation where we are in, in countries like uh, in Europe and the US is completely different to what we see in the rest of the world. Uh, yesterday in another debate I mentioned the situation in India. In India you have four cities with a metro. You have a New Delhi, mm -hmm. a, a small line in Mumbai, in Calcutta, and a new line which has been just uh, opened recently, a metro line in uh, Bangalore. That's all for a country like uh, India. So you see there are potential, potentially tremendous uh, uh, investment which has to be made in this part of the world. If we go back to, to Europe, it's true that uh, I think that the, the best people in terms of electrification is the rail sector, globally speaking, mm -hmm. and uh, that, that is also important. But uh, of course, all the efforts which have been made by the autonomous car are, are interesting, but they will not solve the issues of uh, congestion because if you have an electric car in the middle of a traffic jam, of course it's good. It's an electric car, but it's still in the middle of a traffic jam. But what, what is important is that um, what what we've seen in Europe, and the, the vice mayor uh, certainly agree with us, is when you, you, you have a new tram in the city, you reshape the, the, the city, not only in terms of traffic, but in terms of architecture, in terms of vision for the, for the people. And this is absolutely uh, essential for the future of our city. And what is also something where, where I think we are not doing a good job, but uh, the industry, the operators, and everybody, the public authority, is about this issue of seamless uh, transport. To have one ticket when you go to a car park, when you go to a railway station, we take the train when you go to the airport, and this does not exist, and the bike as well. So uh, there's still a lot of work to be done, but there is a necessity to have a more coordination between between all the modes of transport. Yeah, well, that's a, and that's a great segue there, but, you know, the discussion about how trams reshape the city, because, of course, obviously, particularly North America and then beyond, we have built cities around the automobile. I was just, uh, I just wrote a piece on informal transit in Manila and, and noted in that that new car sales in, in the Philippines are up 91% in just the last three years. Um, and part of that has to do with land use, because everyone lives in the north, everyone works in the south, and so it has to be funneled through just a handful of routes. They've just figured out their first route for BRT. The whole, the whole thing is a debacle that way. But, um, but I do want to come back. I, I want to flip this question around now, and I want to talk about a little bit about you know, uh, environment zones, eco zones, and sort of the evolution of that. Because I think it's, there's another, another world that's possible here, and we've started seeing the inklings of this with you know, cities like Paris beginning to ban cars in the city center, at least you know, diesel engines, com internal combustion engines, and start you know, this area of we're going to designate this as, as a particular test zone and figure out how that scales. And so my question is, is, is what, if, what if we did the opposite? What if we banned cars from city centers tomorrow, all of them, and basically you know, scaled up these eco zones? Um, what would that require in terms of, you know, we would have to put in more trams immediately, and then we'd have to start dealing with the issues of noise and air pollution from trams as they exist now. Um, uh, and, and the other flip side of that is I don't get excited about autonomous cars. I get excited by autonomous electric bikes would be my ideal technology. You push a button on an app, and the bike pedals itself to you where you can either then ride it electric or you can pedal it yourself. Um, MIT Media Lab has been working on this idea for several years now. They have ambitions for this. But it raises interesting questions about you know, the combination of information and various, times of, various forms of mobility. So as part of those remarks, maybe Pex can go first. I'm curious, you know, what have you learned from the teething of your environment zone? Uh, how can you imagine that evolving and scaling up? Could that basically swallow the entire city over time? Are these you know, just interesting pilots, or are these actual plants? paths to actually creating a, a completely eco, eco sure. city. And, and Rotterdam is not far not the first one doing this. Eh? I yeah. think uh, Germany has in 48 or about cities, something like that, and Berlin uh, environmental zone looks a bit like uh, we are doing now in Rotterdam. Um, and Rotterdam means that uh, diesel cars from 15 years and older are not allowed, and uh, passenger cars from before 1992, and that's because we didn't have it, what we call a catalysator. Uh, something in those cars, that, that's the reason why. But as I said in my speech, it's right, really debatable. It's, it's, I mean, the car, of course, is something very private to people. 
So you cannot just say, let's make the whole city an environmental zone, because you really have to prove that it is necessary and to prove by, by digits, by, by telling them that the clean air is, uh, on, is not there, that it is below European levels, and only then you can convince people to, to let uh, their cars, or even <coughs> those cars which are really polluting, to let them home. Uh, and still then it's uh, very difficult to tell. Of course, ship to retail, who says we are depending on people coming by car to the city center. If people go by work, uh, studies, um, and all kinds of uh, things. So um, I don't think it will work. We always say the environmental zone is something uh, temporarily, because of course the biggest contribution in cleaner cars are the manufacturers who are making better, cleaner cars, so they should be the first to work on it. And the newest cars are, are really a great progress uh, combined to the, the cars before 1992, for example, talking about passenger cars. So, um, so we think that about four, five, six years, we don't need it anymore, environmental zone. So to the other direction, not making the whole city an environmental zone, but that at the end, we will cancel the whole idea. Mm -hmm. Michael, please. Maybe a short comment about uh, having special zones and in autonomous driving there is a discussion of course what will happen with old cars which, are, which have not all these advanced kind of assisted systems in the cars about mixed traffic as we call it. Um, we need of course, I'm not a politician, but we need to be careful of course not to discriminate and to say clearly well for the, the ones who can afford uh, we have some nice zones and, and for the ones who can, can spend more money on it, they have electro mobility uh, supported uh, by, by the government, even by, uh, and in, in mixed traffic uh, there's a certain priority, there are certain lanes which are much faster for the ones who can afford. So of course in, in, in cities this is a big task for politicians to make clear, okay, you, you are still, well, you need to be part of the society and can, can circulate. I mean, we all know in the room that mobility is clearly a fundamental right uh, to, uh, to really participate in society mm -hmm. and cutting that off and prioritizing certain things is uh, always a balancing act, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the eco zones, it's, it's really bold and courageous you know, action mm -hmm. and the politicians who are putting it in place around Europe really deserve uh, credit. I think it's a great, I think it's a great step in the right direction. Um, but, but again, I, I yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear also you see it as a first step, like in six years, maybe they, they won't be needed. Uh, there's a couple of issues that I think the eco zones raise. Um, first of all, they probably, you know, if you have a center of your city that has an unacceptable level of, of air pollution or noise pollution, surely they, they help bring that down to a safer level. But uh, in another sense, they actually don't really get to the root of the problem, which is probably that the people who live in the lower density area outside of the eco zone are creating the most emissions. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, they are mitigating the problem in, uh, you know, at, at the moment, um, or mitigating the um, symptom, but probably the source is still um, these households that are outside the city. So there still has to be a way to get to um, the, you know, the greater sources of emissions and, uh, and those households. Um, and, and the other thing, so I, the eco zones are interesting because they are, built ab around reducing air pollution in a given area. But what's attractive to me about them is that to me they're actually more like people zones. It's where the person is prioritized uh, more above the vehicle. And I, I owe a great debt to the Netherlands. Um, I became an urban planner after I rode my bicycle through the Netherlands and I didn't know cities could be like that. I just really, and there was a word that you all have, uh, gazellig. You know, I'd say, this city's so amazing. Like, it's just so cool. I love spending. I love just sitting on the street, and like a, my my Dutch host would say, "Oh yeah, it's very gazellic." And and I said, "Well, what does that mean in English?" And uh, and they said, "Well, there's no translation in English. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It's some combination of cozy and human scaled." And then they kind of paused, and they were like, "You know, it's a place where you feel like you can be yourself." And it was that was such a foreign feeling to me. Um, and I think like that's. I think that's, to me, what's really valuable about those eco zones. Uh, and, and so I, I think call them people zones, call them places where the people is above the automobile. And then the effect that they have, I think, is essentially that of congestion pricing. You're just, mm -hmm. you're mitigating the, the, the demand. Um, so I think, like, the, the value to people is that they have the priority. The value for the transport system is that they uh, mitigate congestion. 
We bring, okay, since you bring up congestion pricing there, I was going to ask, uh, it's, it's one thing for us to sit here and, and essentially fantasize about my autonomous electric bikes and, uh, and, and city-sized eco-zones, but it comes back to the question of how we're going to pay for this. Both Pex and Philippe really discussed this a bit about the need for subsidies for some electric delivery vehicles, the need for PPPs and other sort of innovative financial structures to pay for the shifts. Um, I'm curious, starting perhaps with the two of you and then and with the other gentleman, um, how would you pay for it? What, what, in a perfect world, I guess, what are, what are the other sort of financial instruments you'd like to see made available for this to actually do it? I mean, congestion pricing becomes my immediate one. Just We'll just pay for it with congestion pricing, and it'll fix itself. But, um, but I am curious how you think you know, this, the, the, the sort of evolution of, of these instruments to actually make, we, make this transition possible. How can, we actually, how can we actually afford it? How can we actually pay for it? I think that the, the, the best example in Europe is what's happening in the center of the city of London, that's where they have a really uh, congestion surge, and people are not complaining anymore about it. So, so you pay money to go to London through the conge to, with this congestion surge, so that's, a, I think, it's a certainly a big success. Then after you have the, 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 the toll system, and which does not exist in, in a lot of parts of, of Europe, and you know, it's, it's not very fair for the rail sector because we, we have the system of track access charges, so we, we pay for for the use of the, 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 the tracks, and that, that's uh, through, and we we give money to, uh, to the, 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 the we have to go through the system of the infrastructure manager almost all, all over Europe. And it's not the case for the, the, the cars because, because all over Europe so you have uh, countries where there are no toll systems for the motorway, so that's a, a, a big problem. Uh, after that, uh, it's interesting, but uh, sometimes when there's a political will. It's exactly what we did on the shift to rail process. It, it really came from, from UNIFE. We sat at the table with the, the members of the industry, said it's for, for rail research. It's time to, to have something which is uh, uh, ambitious. And, and we, we, we told the commission, let's do something together. And we put 50% of the money on the table. And we've been able to, to, to put the money. And now the, the, the program has been launched. So it's interesting to see that. Sometimes it's possible to do things. What has been extremely disappointing for our, our sector is that, uh, globally speaking, but maybe there's been there's been only a few successes in terms of PPP for the the, 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 the rail sector, and especially for there are some PPPs for there's been a, uh, there are some trams projects, for example, in France or the UK, which is could be could be financed through the PPP system, and you know that uh, uh, President Juncker has launched uh, last year his uh, Juncker plan called FC, which is supposed to, to, to invest 350 billions of euros. But for, for the, the, the red sector, there's almost nothing on it because it's very difficult to, to, to find the private money. So uh, we, we need to, to find solution because if we want to, to continue to invest, you need to find the solution. And I think the example of what we did with Shift Rail is a good example of what can be done, but you really need a real political will. A few short comments. Uh, I think um, congestion pricing in the Netherlands is absolutely fair, sensitive area. Many ministers in the last 20, 30 years tried to come up with a scheme and a project, but they all failed in the end. Um, we have only congestion pricing or some toll system with uh, two or three tunnels or bridges, that's all. Mm -hmm. So our highways uh, are still free. Please come. Uh, prefer, prefer, preferably by, uh, by train, of course. Uh, so the only pricing system we have is parking, and that's used very much in the inner cities. I think parking in Amsterdam is about uh, at least six euros an hour on the streets in the very inner cities. But then, of course, you get a reduction on the price if you park your car on, on in the banlieue, the, the outside of the city, and then go by uh, by tram metro to the inner city. Uh, so that's about the same in Rotterdam. But our our city after the Second World War is really made for cars. So uh, people don't understand if you put too much price on uh, going by car to the inner city. That's why our par parking, uh, as, both for the visitors as for the people who live there, uh, parking is quite cheap. Um, so that's another problem. So, um, so that the only thing we can steer is with parking pricing and with uh, things like uh, the emission zone. That's only the only options we have uh, to uh, try to influence the, uh, the quantity and the, of the cars, and for the rest, indeed, we make it gezellig by uh, by our um, way of uh, of creating a nice zones, uh, pedestrians and bicycles, dedicated bike lanes, 
priority by bikes, and we now even do a project, a pilot, that uh, if it's raining in Rotterdam, bikes get more green light at the crossings than cars. Mm -hmm. So longer green light, so they are earlier at home, hopefully a little bit less wet than they were before. But that's just more or less a joke. But <laughs> it still works, and it helps in th thinking that biking is important now. So we call it the new highly cow of uh, Rotterdam. Great. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm kind of, I'm obsessed with how well I think congestion pricing could work, but I'm still very deterred by the fact that there's really three or four cities globally that have been able to implement it. And I think that's because as good a solution as it is, it still requires an immense amount of political capital. You know, in the U.S., Michael Bloomberg couldn't, mm. uh, couldn't get it um, put in New York City, and uh, there, there isn't, you know, he's the strongest mayor, I think. Mm. And it's worth noting that all the politicians who oppose that in the state of Albany are now basically in prison for corruption. So, <laughs> no. so the, entren the entrenched getting, are get, very entrenched. But getting into New York, you need to go by tunnel if you go by car. And that's about 12, 14, say, why are we not 14 dollars the one there? way. Huh? Yeah. Right. I mean, in a certain sense, it's, it, it'd be a very easy place to install uh, because of the water borders. It'd be, and and the, yeah. tunnel, the tunnel prices do serve to some degree like a congestion charge. Um, but, you know, I think congestion pricing, we have to admit, it has a real, it has a real issue with political capital. And I, I think one of the things behind that is that almost everywhere, the people who have the most political power own cars. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, it's difficult. At London did a great job. It, when, the, when the policy went in, it was publicly unfavorable, but it proved itself over time. Uh, and now it has a favor, favorable rating. Uh, but as long as the majority of a populace owns cars, I think there's going to be very strong, possibly insurmountable resistance to putting in uh, a pricing scheme like that. So one of the things that I'm interested in is how access, instead of ownership of cars, can help to break down that political barrier. So I think people are afraid to fully give up on cars. Um, but as Michael was saying, you know, they don't have to anymore. You can have... I have access to cars and use them regularly, but I don't own one. And I think as maybe more people are, you know, they don't have a $30,000 investment in a vehicle that they then want to protect yeah. through their votes, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll be a little bit more uh, supportive of a measure like congestion pricing, especially if it brings, if the revenue from it brings better options, better alternatives. Michael, please. Maybe just to add on, I think this is a crucial point, I agree. Uh, but political capital is uh, key to get certain things to change now. But a lot has really to do with it, with attitude, with with learning, and and that we see some changes. And again, in digital times, I I think uh, we see good examples where the learning has started. Let's take, for example, the music consumption. Uh, I remember in my generation, or even the older ones, they have physically stored something. So it's about ownership, ownership, and more excluding others. You know what number one is today in 2016? It is streaming. So irrespective of you want to, to have the, you want to have access right now, and you do not want to store it somewhere in your cabin. And when it comes to mobility, we are observing, of course, the same uh, kind of behavior, in particular in bigger cities. I have to say that people are thinking, well, I cannot store really a car. Is it important for me? But I would, of course, I need a mobility offer. And uh, the one who can give me an attractive offer, uh, and not necessarily excluding others, and I do not need to own in the classical legal uh, sense, but I want to like to access and use it now. Uh, and, and I think the companies and startups who have the right answers for, for these challenges, they have a big advantage. Well, I, wanna, I, wanna, I was hoping you could expand upon this a little bit, because I think it's interesting, um, you know, as, as since you control a mapping service, you know, mapping, mapping services, the map increasingly is the territory, to borrow the old saying, where, you know, as people rely more and more on their smartphones, the mapping representation of reality defines how they see resources, uh, accessible things, et cetera, et cetera, um, which I think is interesting in a couple of respects. I was hoping all of you might be able to talk upon this. One, one of the sense of, you know, uh, in addition to simply finding cars as a service, uh, increasingly we can use mapping to find things around us, right? There's a definition of mobility in the sense of accessibility to goods and services. So if you have an increasing amount of information around the world around you, you can intensify those uses and leads to land use changes. So I'm interested in that. Um, I'm also interested in the sense of you know, how the data you're collecting allow, will allow us to figure out how we want to reshape the city in various ways beyond the car. Um, and I was thinking this, uh, I talked to Astro Teller at Google X uh, a couple of years ago, he was at a conference, and he made it quite clear that Google saw 
the opportunities for the autonomous cars is basically data collection platforms because they would understand how autonomous cars picking you up at a tram and taking up the last mile would really allow them to see first how the actual dimensions of the city were changing, which would be extremely valuable data to give to real estate developers. So I, I, guess, I guess a question for all of you is, is yeah, is, is beyond simply optimizing traffic, what other, what other forms of you know, uh, data can we collect from this and how it can feed into you know, mobility as a service apps, things like that? Pax, I'd be curious your thoughts on what kind of data you would like from services like here, and then you know the TNCs. There's a lot of debate, obviously, about what data cities want from Uber and other services to help them make decisions about traffic and optimization of this. And yeah, other thoughts on you know as we lay this increasingly rich digital overlay on reality, how can we use it beyond you know simple you know, routing algorithms that exist today? But what what comes in the future? So I don't know, Michael, if you want to take that first. Yeah, I mean, you, you summarized it quite well already. And, and with this question, you, you alluded already to, to a lot of potential, what I was trying to say in, in the first part. Uh, but I mean, clearly, the, the map as we know today has nothing to do with the map of, of tomorrow. Um, it, it is kind of, I mean, you are, most of you are in the age, you know that this paper version, where we all had the same view on Rotterdam, uh, in, even today, I mean, your view of Rotterdam is different than my view because I have in the digital map highly personalized information, point of interest, because we know, of course, um, from the past where I'm interested in. I like a certain type of coffee shop and I have some mobility patterns and preferences. And all this is kind of worked into my view and my personalized individual uh, view. So this is completely different and gives a lot of opportunity. And with this data, you can, of course, if you have a bit of creativity and fantasy in the morning, even if it's quite early, you may think, well, but this is interesting. If these people are usually taking this way, then of course I can not only offer, but I can bring him to, to certain, uh, to, to, the, to the place he, he would like to be. I mean, even today, I'm no longer using an alarm clock, but I, I'm just kind of, well, informing my, my, my smartphone where I want to be. And of course, and it's up to the technique to count back because they know how long I'm showering, how long I take for my espresso, what is about the weather condition, what about the traffic, and then the perfect moment when I have to start up in the morning is calculated by, well, smart data. So only one example. But this is really opening up the door for, for a lot of opportunities. Of course, there's a, the big privacy issue about the things uh, you were mentioning. For example, visiting a coffee shop in the Netherlands. We call coffee shops most places. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so then we, the owner would know the clients of the coffee shop, how much marijuana has to be in store. Uh, we like to know if people buy their stuff over there, go in the car, smoke already something, so they are influenced their driving behavior. So you can <coughs> you can collect all kinds of data. Uh, but there's also <coughs> it's nice to know, but we of course as a government, a local authority, also need to have to test need to know. And uh, <coughs> so we need a lot more of data, absolutely. But there there will be a big debate about privacy and what kind of data for me, my personal life will go to, uh, to, to the local authorities and what do they do with it? Uh, and it's still the big debate. We have, <coughs> for parking policies, of course, it's very interesting to know how many cars are there on the streets, how many empty spaces are in the parking garages. We have the policy, we prefer to have the cars in the garage and not on the street. <coughs> so uh, we do a lot of data collection about this and it's all open. So also for the commercial, uh, commercial firms who exploit the, um, the parking garage, they can just see how many cars, how many empty spaces there are in the municipal parking garages. So, and of course, we need it for making uh, the policies uh, in this, this area. So all this is, is very important for our emission zone. We need a lot of data. Where is the points of entry? What do they do? How long are they in the emission zones? And we're still just at the beginning of collecting this. Uh, and, and a lot of policies are going by uh, just sensitive issues and we think this will be the behavior of uh, <coughs> of, uh, of mobility but we don't know for sure so there's a, there's a lot of improvement to make and firms like here can help us uh, a lot of it sure uh, a quick comment by michael again very quick to... comment sorry oh. only very quick comment um i, I think we, we all need to work a bit on a new data culture 
I feel in the discussion frequently, you now you talked about the authorities and the risks. I admitted in the, the beginning this is a major topic and we need to address it very carefully. So consumer need to be in the center and really decide about some data. But it, there's kind of, there are a lot of fears. I mean, let's take the car or the mobility solution. People are talking about this question like, who is owning the data of a car? And making no distinction between the pure use of, I don't know, the technical, the engine consumption, what is clearly more belonging, not owned by the car manufacturers, and maybe the music consumption. in it. So let's make a very proper um, kind of distinction there. And the other quick remark is about um, open data. I feel that a lot of entities, authorities, companies sitting on data, there are some studies out that more than 80% of the data is at the wrong place. Because people are sitting on, they do not really know, but they're uncertain, they see, they feel there's a value, but they're not sharing it. And this we need to kind of overcome and share and work more with, of course, respecting clear fundamental rights and interests of privacy. I just want to say that today, if you look in the city that I know quite well, is in Paris for the young generation. They, if you are in a, in a train, get at the railway station, have a look at your iPhone, and you know where the electric cars are available. And you know, you go to get the car, go to another place. They tell you where the you if you want to go in this part of the city, then you know where you will be able to car park. Then after that, you have these uh, Vélib, these uh, bicycles that you rent for. Uh, 30 euros for a whole year. And so the, now things are really improving and, and, and those young people, they don't own their car. They just rent a car and now they, they, there are a lot of startups. And then you, you know that uh, the, the bigger operators and the incumbent operators, that's how they call them in, in Brussels, are all, also now trying to, to, to solve those issues because they, they understand that they have to be in the middle of those, those debates. And they you take, for example, XNCF, they now own uh, uh, not only buses, uh, coaches, mm -hmm. but also they, they rent cars, which is a big change in terms of mobility. But it's true that I, I know that the big operators and big companies are today saying that they don't want to give the way the, the information on the data. So there are still the big debates, uh, for example, in Paris, where they say, no, we are not going to give the information. And they would, I don't know what would be the, the, the outcome of the debate, but there is a, a debate. Yeah, yeah. Um, two points on the data. Uh, first, with some of the new mobility services that we're seeing, mm -hmm. um, you know, Uber, Lyft, uh, and, and other services are right now v really protecting their data and not sharing it with cities. Um, I think, you know, I think these services have a lot to offer cities, uh, and, but cities also have something to offer them, and that's the right to operate, you know, within the city. Um, and I think they're, I think the these services sh uh, should be encouraged, but must also play ball with the city. Should be sharing data. That's, you know, the these businesses are built on public infrastructure and the use mm -hmm. of it, and I think owe a clear debt towards sharing data uh, if if they're going to be permitted. So I'd say that's one type of data that I think it needs to protect users' privacy, but that's possible through randomization of data, and, and, and then it needs to be shared with cities so cities can further plan the infrastructure that makes these business models work. They can understand what roads need to be paved, where people need to be. Uh, and then the second, and this is coming uh, from a little bit of a different, uh, a different ballpark, but um, my organization, Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, we work primarily in developing countries where there is very little data. Yeah. And uh, one thing that we've seen could be a game changer, you know, that when you're a transportation planner, the richest data sets you get are origin destination sets. When you're planning transportation, um, that's, ex that's also the most expensive type of data to get. You usually need to make, do, you know, tens of thousands of household phone calls and ask them detailed questions about everywhere they went. Uh, this could be completely shortcut in developing countries if mobile telecoms uh, shared tower data in a randomized way with governments. And so uh, right now, there's no law requiring them to do so. Usually they don't cooperate or they'll do, they only cooperate at a really uh, high fee. But you know, this would allow a lot of developing countries, and it would even be valuable, I think, for many developed countries where they have this data but are spending a lot of money to get it it would allow them to really leapfrog this process and have, you know, again, better data, better planning um, to, to improve infrastructure and services. 
Great. Well, I have one more question before we open it up for questions in the audience. I hope you're preparing questions right now in your own heads. Um, after our detour into big data, where we all, every panel must go in 2016, um, I want to come back again uh, to, you know, particularly focusing on, you know, obscuring, reducing and obscuring air and noise pollution in the sense of, I, in the United States, I've been, I've been very cheered by the fact that a number of cities in several high profile cases are tearing down urban highways. They're ripping out the canyon-like highways that we put into our cities, which generate so much noise and, and air pollution for the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and then in other cases, New York is an example of where Hudson Yards is a whole neighborhood that's being built on top of a platform over a train yard. So we're trying to convert, you know, these huge transport infrastructure body, you know, uh, structures back into actual urban livable space. Um, I guess I'm curious your thoughts. Pax, is there any part of Rotterdam that you'd like to demolish and turn over into park space for that? Or are, are thoughts from the other panelists about, you know, how we can actually make a better, make a better piece with this? I mean, uh, Philippe, in the case of rail, I mean, in addition to trams and everything else, like, obviously to do urban logistics in, in a dense way, we have to continue building heavy diesel rail into our cities. So how can we obscure them, hide them, put them behind forest, uh, uh, whatever it takes to basically sort of, you know, separate them from livable neighborhoods, even as we bring them into cities. There's a lot of challenges around this in terms of actual built physical form of transport. It's, a, it's all about uh, the policies and the land use planning is the most important. So what you do is build the bigger offices and the bigger firms with a lot of people above public transportation. Uh, like you mentioned uh, that example, so we, we did already a, a lot in the Netherlands, not all over the place, because <clears throat> there are firms who say uh, we don't want to be in the inner city, we would like to have our firm more outside, uh, nevertheless they have a lot of people, and if uh, they talk to, to the local uh, city people, and if you don't agree with us, we just go to your neighbor, because they are prepared to give us that uh, piece of land outside the inner city. So sometimes it's a lot of blackmailing there too. Uh, so we need, really need, <coughs> in the Netherlands also we have it, but <coughs> less concrete, less, uh, less precise than we had uh, about 20 years ago, <coughs> a policy in which uh, uh, from national level, <coughs> or at least the regional level, there are prescriptions and rules about how to use your land. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the other hand, I mean, the Netherlands is so dense populated, 70 million people on the shore, so we are already done. I mean, a lot of the country is just full, uh, and especially also, even in Rotterdam, we have so much space after the World War, uh, we have so much uh, space now filled in, uh, and also a good public transport transportation system with trams, metro, uh, buses. Uh, so we think uh, there's parts of the city in which we say we should improve the public transportation even a little bit more because too much car uh, cars and there are too many highways. So I, I, I said uh, the one example is also in, in a city we are going to make a four lane uh, and big uh, street uh, in, and we reduce the lanes, make it only two. It's right in the middle of the center. Um, and uh, that will help a little. But uh, in this sense, Rotterdam is a little bit an exception in the rest of the country. Yeah. Well, All right. Well, let's open up to any questions from the audience. Yes, we have one from the gentleman right here. I think we have some microphones coming up. If you can wait for the mic, I think we have some recording stuff that we'd like you to get on. Well, honestly, I have more of a comment than a question. <laughs> but. I thought this was a fantastic discussion, and, and I wanted to just remind us all that, um, that the grid is not green today. And you asked a great question, Greg, what if we had electric cars today? And I think you know, we need to decarbonize transport. We need electric cars. But there's a crisis of air pollution right now. People are dying. Uh, Mexico City, you've seen in the news, has the worst air pollution it's had in decades. Um, and 80% of that particulate matter is caused by transport. Um, and that, that problem is fueled by policy, right? So 72% of transport budget is dedicated toward building highways that encourages more driving that's contributing to the problem of pollution. And unless we fix that underlying problem, that pollution problem will stay with us until we can finally decarbonize transport through electric cars and a green grid many, many years from now. It's projected that It'll be around 2060 to 2080 before we fully decarbonize the transport system. And we need to do that, but we need immediate solutions today that really address the crisis we have. So I, I agree with all of you. We really need all of the above solutions. 
I just want to encourage us to really think well beyond the electric car as just one part of a more holistic palette of solutions. Thanks. Oh, I'm Clayton Lane from ITDP. Thank you. Um, I, I want to build a question off of that, which is going back to our earlier discussion about electric cars, if we simply electrified mobility, would that solve all the problems? Because he brings up the excellent point, uh, which is it is very easy for us to take the next step and be like, well, great, wind and solar will make all electric vehicles completely clean emissions. But currently, aren't we shifting simply most of that pollution to our, you know, decreasingly coal, but, you know, natural gas and other sort of fossil fuel-fired plants? Um, yeah, Philippe. I just want to answer to what you said. But the, the, the issue, of course, electric, electric cars is important. But the, 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 if you want to improve the solution, you need to invest a lot in rail uh, because this is the, the, the only way to solve the, the issue, at least in, 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 in the next years. Uh, but the, the, the problem is how to finance the, the, those, the, those rail projects. And that's it. Uh, I know yesterday I had the opportunity to discuss with the people from the World Bank and the people from the EIB. They are, they, they are investing quite a lot, but still in, the, in the countries like, like Mexico, we didn't find the, the, the solution. So I, I think really the, the first solution is to invest in, in, in rail. Glo globally speaking, from what we see all over the world, there is a, a trend because even in countries who are uh, having um, big dif uh, economic difficulties, I continue to, to, to invest uh, in rail. But uh, what, what's been done in, in China is, is completely impressive. In the city like Shanghai, they have now more than 400 kilometers of metros, which have been built uh, in less than 20 years, which shows that. But I think that's a very powerful country and they can make it. But in other parts of the world, I, th I think this, the solution is only to invest in rail, at least uh, urgently, I would say. Yes, Colin. Uh, I, agree with the state I agree with the statement, have a slight counterpoint, though. I wouldn't say necessarily rail in every place. I think rapid transit, which is often well served by rail, um, but because rail is, is expensive to build uh, per kilometer, and much of the world, even in the developing countries, is at a density that would be economically difficult to support, uh, to support rail. I think, you know, in some cases, so we need land use change as well in some places. Uh, we can use intermediate solutions. You know, uh, one thing that's interesting about shared mobility is it's an option. It's an alternative to, to owning or driving your own car, even in very suburban areas. Um, and so it's bringing new options. And then also technologies like bus rapid transit, which can help build the corridor uh, density around that, around transit. And you know, I think sometimes if density goes up, or also you have a noise issue um, with bus rapid transit uh, on the surface level, then maybe that can help build, uh, you know, that can, the next step can be rail or, or, or subterranean rapid transit. Uh, but, but I agree that the backbone, I think, I don't think cars, no matter what, fuels them or what engine is in them will ever be compatible with successful cities. I think, and that's just a geometric uh, mm -hmm. issue, is you just, you know, a city is a density of people. And I don't think, even if you shrink the cars and make them very efficient, um, a one car to one person ratio, a very car dependent city is never gonna, never gonna be successful as a city. So maybe some cars, but definitely rapid transit will always be the backbone, even with the smartest and most zero emission vehicles mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that can be created. Great. Other questions? All right. Short her, if, I, if I may. Uh, oh, for sure. Sorry. We have a question from her and then him. Um, we are not, Hello? Uh, sorry, we are not going to do uh, extensive discussion on energy policy, but you're absolutely right. When fossil fuels are uh, fueling uh, electric cars, then we are not there yet. And so, Everywhere, every country is now thinking about Germany as the biggest beautiful example of the Energiewende, where fossil fuels uh, are, and that's also in the Netherlands, um, so we try wind and solar, uh, but it has its um, restrictions too, and the quantity is still not there to go uh, beyond fossil fuels in the near future within five or six years, but I think everyone knows that after Paris, December 2015, something changed. And uh, all countries are working on it uh, on a different scale and speed. Uh, so, but you are absolutely right. Without that, then electric car electrification is not uh, the real option. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. Your question, please. Oui, uh, bonjour. Vous m'entendez? Uh, alors, en fait, uh, cette discussion est extrêmement. 
this is a very interesting discussion, particularly considering the reduction of emission in cities. However, it is true that the electric car and the fully autonomously driving car are seen in a too similar way. They are mixed up too much because a fully autonomous car is a great novelty, whereas the electric car is more about reducing atmospheric emissions, noise emissions. A completely autonomous car doesn't really have the same objectives or consequences in its use, but perhaps it could lead to a reduction of traffic congestion in urban areas and people could use their time better. They could watch a movie or read the newspaper. And then perhaps congestions in the cities would not be seen as a purely negative thing. And that in turn could lead to these vehicles being used in a very different way. That wouldn't be too bad. And that could lead to an addition to congestion in the urban areas. So regarding the title of this discussion, it's problematic if we do not separate these two things. Well, I think it was an interesting observation, um, and uh, I think when we call it this is third place, um, you have now home, you have office, and you have the mobility solution. And um, maybe I'm a bit too business oriented uh, today, but uh, I see as well there are a lot of opportunity. If you're sitting in a commuting solution, mobility solution, or you're sitting in a car, and um, in, in the very near future you can focus on other things than, than just really uh, driving, uh, well, this may be an opportunity, of course. And bringing people uh, some time back is maybe not a, not a bad thing as such. Please. Okay. Uh, admittedly, I only got my headphones on and switched to English uh, <laughs> for the last half. But uh, what I heard was if we're stuck in congestion, but we're in an autonomous vehicle and we can do work or watch a movie, um, maybe that's not so bad. Is that really congestion? Is that's it really? What is it, argued, is it really right? congestion? Yeah, is it? Is. Um, I mean, I think that's probably up to a lot of us to decide on a personal level, but I can share mine. And um, I mean, I, th I think that sounds awful. Um, I, you know, again, um, what, so what's, is that the life we want? Let's take it back to the vision of, our, of the life we want and the city we want. Um, do we want to be, you know, stuck in moving pods, watching TV or doing work. Um, I don't know, is that, that, to me, so what's the gain? Um, I guess we could probably, we could potentially live further apart, we could live further out from the city, and, and maybe the gain is that for someone who really uh, doesn't want to live in a city but needs to go there for work, that might enable it and they might have more productive time. Um, but you know, if I, even if I'm just going to sit around and do work, I'd rather do it in my office with my colleagues. I'd rather, you know, walk into a cafe and, uh, you know, I think, you know, even just, uh, I, I think that we would, we would, you know, this is why we're even here at a conference to bounce into one another and to talk about ideas and to have, you know, these interactions. And I think it would really separate those interactions. I think it might really strip um, a lot of my favorite parts of my everyday life from from that. So. That's a really personal reaction. It's not qualified by data. I think it's something everybody's going to have to think about, um, and we're going to have to see. Like you know, uh, you know, there's all kinds of other things we could talk about. Is mm -hmm. can, the energy efficiency of being stuck in moving pods, doing these things? But again, what's we got to get at? Why we would want to do that? If if we would if we want to live far apart, then that might be a reason. That might be an enabler. But uh, if it's just a way for us to preserve a system, you know, that we currently live in and sl slightly make it better, uh, but, it's a, but it's a system or it's a, it's a lifestyle that we don't really like or, or has a lot of negative um, externalities, uh, I, I don't think that's worth it. I'll share one more thing. I, I have a couple people that I'm close with that have severe depression. And so I read a lot of uh, literature um, about 
depression, and the rates of depression around the world are skyrocketing. They talk about it as a lifestyle disease um, because our lifestyles have changed so much. Uh, there's been four studies out in the last 10 years that show that physical activity and being around other people um, each independently, so they do double-blind tests, and they show that 30 minutes a day of brisk walking is better for treating depression than any antidepressant on the market. Um, so that, you know, it gets to happiness, too, in a very direct way. Um, that, that walking and, and also, and then the other thing they test is uh, how much you're around other people. And that also has a tremendous antidepressant effect. It literally creates happiness. So I think we really, I mean, you know, again, it's just getting back to really what the end goal is, and that's that we all lead happy and healthy lives. And I, I don't think that system could do it, so. Thank you. I want to get more questions in, so please, this gentleman here. My name is Adusei from Amsterdam. I have a simple question for Mr. Langenberg. Um, um, I've been living in Holland for the past 25 years. Um, and what I see is that bicycle is a way of life for the Dutch. Um, cycling is a culture of the Dutch. And um, all measures are being put in place uh, to encourage the use of bicycle. And that will solve a lot of problems you're talking about here. Um, I want to ask you um, in Rotterdam as to whether you have a long-term policy um, and a clear goal, the percentage, percentage of the usage of bicycle to the population for the coming years, maybe five years, ten years, and as to whether you are open to um, um, working together with Amsterdam, which is maybe the, cap the capital of the, this country, um, with more bicycles there. Because uh, I'm working there as well, and I'm into bicycles, and uh, I encourage um, people to train uh, uh, women, migrants, uh, to use bicycle because of aff affordability problems, I, I actually. So I just want to see as to whether there's a policy where uh, also other parts of the cities uh, can copy because Dutch is known as the use of uh, bicycles. So if I understand your question well, you're asking how in in Rotterdam, we try to get migrants on the bicycle. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's, <clears throat> yes. Especially in Rotterdam, more than other one other city in the Netherlands has a lot of migrants. We have about as many nationalities as the United Nations has members. Um, most <clears throat> most of them come from North African countries but also from farther away, and especially they are not used to bikes, sometimes religion and Muslim uh, thinking is not uh, really comparable with uh, bikes, especially women don't use bikes. So, but so um, we have to be very careful about this because just uh, have biking schools and uh, encourage those people to use that school and go on biking doesn't help. So it's, it's a cultural thing. And just by living by example, and you see the bene be benefits of uh, uh, of biking helps an enormously. And we also do some slightly kinds of education, indeed, or try to at least to get the kids on on bikes, and just stress the the advantages of healthy life, and uh, fitness, uh, and also the practicality. It's cheap. Not all those those people have the, the big salaries as uh, white people in in Rotterdam, so that's also one of the arguments. So it's really a mix and a match uh, for being very careful policies to get those people on bikes, uh, and no, the more they integrate, of course, with uh, the rest of uh, the Rotterdam people and the Rotterdam lifestyle, the more you will see them on bikes. Great. I think we have time for one last question. Anyone? Anyone? All right, well, then I'll ask one final quick question for you. So I thought it was great. Obviously, we've burst beyond the boundaries of air and noise pollution to basically discussing all externalities in cities. I was thinking, like, you know, we could do a whole session on reducing depression in cities after that. So as one final lightning round question, if, 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 if something comes to mind, is what, what, what is another externality in cities that we're not talking about that we should be trying to reduce as part of this, about rethinking trans in, in sort of sustainable transport revolution? You know, you brought up obesity earlier, and you brought up some other. What other sort of health health crisis or inequality crisis or something else we should be thinking about that goes hand in hand with reducing air and noise pollution and thinking about this quality of life? Um, any other dimensions that are particularly resonant with you that we should be trying to improve in this? This should be an active policy. Please. 
I don't think it's an externality, but we need to find solutions, financing for, for solutions, because mm. if there are no financing solutions, then the situation will worsen in a big part of the world, even if there's been big commitments in COP21, but uh, the, the, there's an issue of financing public transport all over the world. Ben, I was struck earlier by your comment about, you know, the, about the Chinese cities that are massively building in metros. They're doing so with a municipal debt load that threatens to topple the entire system there. So it'll be interesting to see if, you know, if metros basically bring down the Chinese economy, sadly, at least in the short run. Michael? Yeah, maybe. I mean, in the industry, we are a lot talking about platform economy. And we started already to kind of, you asked the question about to what extent can can all players uh, can can work better together. And I think it is worth of more thinking about to what kind of new cooperation and, and, and way of working together uh, can be kind of, work, kind of worked on. I mean, it is clear for me that one city alone cannot do, it is not the industry which cannot do uh, it completely alone. So, um, but the, the current setup in the society, how people are still thinking, uh, in some of places in, in silos, uh, I think it's worth of focusing on on which way they can better cooperate um, in the interest of uh, really making a difference to to air and noise pollution. Okay. Yes, maybe two remarks. Uh, I think leisure time um, is an issue. I mean, more and more people are, have more time. R working hours are less. Of course, there are big exceptions of people who work on Wall Street or so, who are working 80 80 hours per week, but these are just a small number of people. Most of the people get more leisure time, more vacation time. So uh, what does that mean for transportation patterns, the, the modes of transport? Um, and more people, of course, there are big uh, August vacations, but uh, during the year, there are far more op opportunities for this uh, also. And, and uh, it is not new, but the second um, observation I would mention is, and it's not new at all, but is the just-in-time delivery. So many shops and retailers just have a very limited office uh, store space, so they use it for selling their uh, goods uh, and articles instead of uh, storing them, which means that there will be more than one day delivery, not, one, not more than one week delivery, which is uh, really a, a big challenge, of course, for inner cities. And then the data comes in. It would be interesting to know all these trucks who are going into the city, sometimes three times to the same uh, retail, to the same shop, is that truck fully loaded? Or is it only for 20% or something? Mm -hmm. And could you try to find an incentive system in which 80% loading will give you an incentive uh, or give you the priority on bus lanes, something like that? So we tried that examples in other cities in the Netherlands, it was ab ab abolished again. But uh, I think that will be really the solution is, is uh, carrot and stick. Uh, rules have to be, uh, and tell those people, the delivery fans, that you are only allowed to deliver in the early or early hours of the, of, the, of the day. If you want to do it during the night or in the afternoon, you really have to do it in an electric car uh, with uh, at least 80% uh, full of goods uh, and other of kinds of uh, statistics where, where you try to, uh, to make it as uh, sustainable as possible. Yeah, it's interesting. As a final note, is a, I worked on a project at New York University uh, several years ago where we imagined futures of transport. We imagined that Boston and Cambridge uh, banned all cars in the city center and apartment sizes shrank because people were keeping more of their physical objects in the cloud, so to speak, delivery services to and from their apartments. So what ultimately the cities found is that they, even though they had banned cars, they now had to take extreme measures against delivery vehicles for real-time delivery. So instead of autonomous cars, they had autonomous delivery robots in the middle of the night to imagine that scenario. Colin, you want to make a final remark? Sure. Uh, t t you know, in terms of other issues, and I think it even speaks to the gentleman, the last question that was asked, I would say equity. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this both in the United States where I live, but also in a lot of the developing countries where I work, we're seeing... Um, we are seeing at least in central zones, I think there is, a idea, there is a new idea of the city that is going very global. And so we're seeing bike share in the center of Mexico City. Um, we're seeing new transit options. We're seeing new investments in public space. Um, many of, much of it is modeled after, you know, I think European cities, uh, whether like, the investments ha happening in the US and other places. Um, but it's only in a part of the city. And uh, that, has in one sense that has to do with scale. You can't uh, improve everywhere across the city all at once, but um, but they are concentrated generally in the wealthy areas. 
Uh, and I think that is fueling inequity in the cities. Um, I, think it, I think it adds fuel to gentrification issues. Um, and I think the model that I find really inspiring um, is Enrique Peñalosa in Bogota, who not only did a lot to improve the city center and pedestrianize areas that are nice places to shop, but also really you know, built beautiful, expensive bridges just for bikes in the poorest neighborhoods. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's also a way of really enfranchising people around cycling, around feeling them, be, feeling them, making them feel included. Great. All right, well, thank you so much. Would you please give a round of applause for our panelists? Thank you.